Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Sharice Frazier, and I am the chair of the National Bar Association Health Law Section. On behalf of the NBA, I'd just like to thank you guys for taking time out of your schedules uh, for this very uh, timely and important topic. We have a dynamic group of panelists this afternoon who is going to share their insight and expertise. Uh, and so we're gonna kick this off with um, our moderator for the day, Ms. Kanita Silly from Black Women's Health Imperative. And she will um, engage our panelists in a very robust discussion. Um, if you have questions, uh, please uh, put those in the Q&A section and we will address those towards the end of the panel. And then also, if you wanna learn more about the MBA health law section, please reach out to me. So uh, let's enjoy this very important discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharice, and good afternoon. Again, my name is Kanita Seely, and I'm policy counsel from the Black Women's Health Imperative. Uh, the Black Women's Health Imperative is a national nonprofit organization that's dedicated to advancing health equity and social justice for Black women and girls in the United States. One of our core areas of focus is reproductive justice and abortion access. It is so great to co-host this event with the National Bar Association Health Law Section, and of course, to moderate this important discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the esteemed panelists today. Uh, we have Dr. Rachel Villanueva, President of the National Medical Association, Ms. Jacqueline Ayers, Senior Vice President of Policy, Organizing, and Campaigns for Planned Parenthood, Ms. Bridget Jackson, Counsel for the Center for Reproductive Rights, and Ms. Terry Jackson, Executive Director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association. Thank you all for being here today. So I'd like to start off the conversation today by asking each one of you to tell us a little, about, a little bit about your organization and what brings you to this conversation. Why are reproductive rights and health so important to you? And I like to, whoever wants to jump off can start the conversation. I'll start. <laughs> um, uh, as you said, I'm Rachel Villanueva. I'm actually an OBGYN. Um, in New York, uh, I represent, I'm president of the National Medical Association, and NMA represents 50,000 Black physicians across the country um, and our patients. And so we take care of uh, Black women. And so reproductive uh, rights and reproductive justice is really so important to us. NMA was founded out of discriminatory laws that didn't allow our physicians to practice and didn't let us to take care of didn't let us take care of Black patients or provided Black patients with substandard care. And so NMA was founded to take care of people and to eliminate disparities. And our, our goal is to achieve optimal health for people and for health equity. Um, personally, as an OBGYN, you know, these things are not um, just theoretical for me. I see them in my practice every day taking care of women. Um, I think of reproductive health as total health for women. Sometimes I'm the only person that that women will see. And I think it's important for women, especially women of color where disparities are disproportionate. Um, I think it's important that we have these conversations to ensure that um, they achieve optimal health and they achieve their, and they are able to keep their autonomy as it uh, uh, relates to their health and particularly their reproductive health. I can jump in uh, next. I'm uh, Jacqueline Ayers, the Senior Vice President for Policy Campaigns and Advocacy. I've been with Planned Parenthood about um, 12 years, but have been working on uh, reproductive health care and health care policy um, for uh, nearly two decades, um, both my time on, on Capitol Hill, um, working with civil rights organizations like the National Urban League. Um, I've always uh, thought it was really important that um, our health laws have to be informed by people who understand uh, how our our people interact with healthcare. Unfortunately, too often uh, policymakers and the folks who are making the decisions are not always reflective of people's lives. And that's especially true when it comes to um, how people uh, access their reproductive health care, because too often this issue has been stigmatized. And I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Um, we know that laws are increasingly put in place uh, to put barriers in people to being able to get the care that they need. And so, you know, at Planned Parenthood, um, we have nearly um, 600 health centers across the country. 
Uh, we uh, uh, see 2.5 million patients a year, um, primarily uh, uh, those are young people, uh, um, uh, all genders. Um, we do provide gender inclusive uh, care. Um, and we know that no matter who you are, right, your ability to um, uh, be able to practice your bodily autonomy to have rights over your body is uh, important to you. And um, that's why as a healthcare provider, as an advocate, um, Planned Parenthood uh, does this work. And I'm really glad that NBA is putting a spotlight on this issue today. Happy to go next. I'm Bridget. I'm counsel with the Lawyers Network at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, and the Center for Reproductive Rights lobby or, is a health care organization that through law and policy. Um, I'm so grateful to be in community with all of you today. Um, I'm so glad that we are raising this issue as far as access to abortion care here in the United States, as well as um, a myriad of other issues that affect not just women, but Black women in particular. Um, as Jacqueline mentioned, um, maternal health, assisted reproduction, all of these things are things that the center focuses on. And I'm so grateful to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Terry Jackson. I'm the executive director of the Women's National Basketball Players Association. And for those of you who don't know, we are the first union to represent um, women athletes. We represent the women of the W. Um, I call them the most amazing athletes on the planet. Um, and hopefully you, you have recognized their work over the many several years, but particularly last year when I am proud to say they saved our democracy quite literally. Coming out of that last season, they framed up, the players framed up a social advocacy agenda um, around racial justice, around LGBTQ um, rights, and also around public health. And it's in that public health space that we are proud partners with the Black Women's Health Imperative. So I'm so happy to be here, to be a part of this conversation, um, to talk about reproductive rights, to talk about how they impact um, people that look very much like the members of our union, my union, the Women's National Basketball Players Association. Um, this is so important to us. Um, and it is particularly significant um, that we recognize that the, the members of our union, the members of the National Women's Soccer League Players Association, um, that what we did together with 500 other athletes and organizations across the country was to sign on to an amicus brief that is very much about abortion care, very much about reproductive rights. Um, this is the first time that you see athletes in mass mobilized um, and weigh in in such great numbers on an abortion case before the Supreme Court. Again, more than 500 athletes in their individual capacities at the collegiate level, amateur level, professional level, um, as well as their unions signing on to one of many, but this particular amicus brief. So again, very proud to be a part of this conversation, to be part of this panel. Thank you. Thanks so much. And undoubtedly, the stakes are high right now and our access to abortions are under attack. Bridget, could you describe some of the current federal and state attacks on reproductive health care and its disproportionate impact on Black women? Absolutely. So attacks on reproductive health care and access um, have increased significantly over the past few years. Well, we've seen a lot of states become emboldened to limit access to comprehensive health care. And these attacks are far reaching from states like New Mexico to Tennessee and everything in between. And what we're seeing is that more and more states are passing laws that effectively are trying to ban abortion access outright. And it's not just abortion access that's being threatened, it's access to contraception, access to comprehensive sex education, adequate prenatal and pregnancy care, and the list goes on. And this, these situations are often, often exceedingly difficult for Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Of course, the two states that are currently receiving the most attention um, are Texas and Mississippi. And in September, Texas passed a law, SB8, that would effectively ban abortion care after six weeks of pregnancy before many people even know they're pregnant. Um, SB8 also shifts enforcement from state officials to private individuals in the state. Um, this is because the state recognizes that it doesn't have the authority to enforce the law under the Constitution, and the law penalizes physicians, as well as any individual who aids and abets a patient in obtaining an abortion after six weeks. 
Um, the law also awards a minimum of, minimum of a $10,000 bounty to any private party who successfully sues under the law. So essentially the law will incentivize individuals to sue, including anti-abortion activists. Um, the Supreme Court did hold oral argument for Whole Woman's Health and the Department of Justice on November 1st to determine the procedural matters of whether the court could properly, um, with the proper venue to block the Texas ban um, or who was the proper party to bring suit. The procedural matters brought before the Supreme Court was to ask the court to block, was simply to block the six week ban thereby stopping the law from going into effect, while the constitutionality of the six-week six ban could, could be adjudicated properly. So we're still waiting from the Supreme Court to issue its decision. So in the meantime, this means that Texas will remain, the ban will remain in effect in Texas, meaning so many people in Texas still lack access to critical healthcare services. Um, and then there's Mississippi. That's also before the Supreme Court. Um, in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, the court will review a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Um, the state of Mississippi has blatantly asked the court to overturn Roe v. Wade. So the sole question before the Supreme Court is whether all pre-viability abortion bans are unconstitutional. The question before the court, I just wanna say this again, is that whether all pre-viability abortion bans are unconstitutional. So this is the first time the court will hear, will rule on the constitutionality of a pre-viability abortion ban since Roe v. Wade in 1973. This pre-viability ban, the standard for pre-viability has been the workable bright line rule that the court has continued to use for nearly 50 years. Um, women have relied on this core precedent, on Roe's core precedent, um, which is whether a, per, a pregnant person has the right to decide whether to continue pregnancy prior to viability. And this has been used for nearly 50 years and it's, being, it's still being used today. So on December 1st, the court will hold oral argument on Jackson, Jackson Women's Health Organization. Correspondingly, black maternal health or black maternal morbidity and mortality rates remain extremely high. Black women continue to have the highest rates of maternal mortality, which is um, three to four times more higher than their white counterparts. This is regardless of income, this is regardless of region, and this is regardless of education. Interestingly, uh, just kind of as an aside, the March of Dimes issued a report, uh, a report card, they do this every year. Um, and in 2020, the country overall received a rating of C minus, Texas received a D minus, and Mississippi received an F. And it should also be said that Mississippi's population is predominantly black. So to be clear, abortion access is absolutely a racial and economic justice issue. Um, a large majority of the patients in these conservative states are black women. And yet the legislators that are passing these laws in Mississippi and other conservative states are mostly male and predominantly white. Um, but despite these attacks on access, we are seeing some progress uh, via Congress. The US House of Representatives passed the Women's Health Protection Act, also known as WIPA. Um, and WIPA is a, is a federal legislation that would create a statutory right for healthcare providers to provide abortion care and a corresponding right for their patients to receive that care, free from medically unnecessary restrictions that impede access. Also, momnibus investments have been included in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, the momnibus is a series of bills which builds on existing maternal health legislation to address the clinical and non-clinical drivers of maternal health crisis in the United States. And so I wanna leave that off on a positive note. We are seeing some progress, even if the states are still a little crazy out there. And thanks so much, Bridget, for that really comprehensive um, explanation of the state policies and regulations and cases that are before us in regards to abortion access, as well as you brought up an important point about maternal mortality and how it's you know disproportionately affecting um, Black women. Black women die at three to four times the rate as white women um, from pregnancy complications. And with that, I want to know, uh, Dr. Villanueva, um, or, or Rachel, what are some of the barriers which prevent women from accessing reproductive health and family planning products and services that you see in your practice or um, generally within uh, healthcare? Sorry, muted, of course. Um, 
I think Bridget did a great job of, of talking about some of uh, the policies and laws that are, are barriers. I think just the same way that um, uh, uh, access is limited to people for just healthcare in general, the same way it's uh, limited to reproductive rights, those broadly, those social determinants of health, those social and economic drivers uh, that affect health outcomes really can serve as barriers for uh, particularly people of color, uh, uh, underrepresented uh, individuals, low income individuals. And so we see that those um, socioeconomic factors, housing, education, employment, um, access to healthcare, I think uh, what also obviously needs to be discussed are structural uh, systems in place, structural racism and implicit bias that exist in our healthcare system that actually support uh, these social determinants of health and support uh, limiting access of women and of individuals, particularly of color, um, to adequate healthcare. Um, I think, you know, something that we have to address as well is the mistrust of our healthcare system by individuals because of this bias and because of this racism. Um, I think it's well supported in research uh, going back to 1985 when they start, started to look at why um, individuals of color did poor, had poor health outcomes um, all the way to unequal treatment in 2003. I mean, it's well documented. What we need to have happen is change as far as looking at those social and economic drivers in our, in our um, in our system and that affect our healthcare system to improve outcomes and, and eliminate disparities. Um, so I think it's just this kind of platform where we're talking about laws and policies and also letting, <laughs> letting the medical person come in and sneak in there as well is really important. Um, but you know, these are things that affect patients being able to and women being able to access um, even basic um, contraceptive care um, prenatal, uh, adequate prenatal care. And we know that women, that racial disparities exist in all of these, um, in all of these areas of reproductive health, cancer, um, vaccines, uh, HPV vaccine, um, contraceptive care, even just having culturally competent or uh, individuals, a, a diverse enough workforce that people, women of color feel comfortable speaking to somebody else. I think that is a really uh, a large issue as well. We know that patients do much better when they and adhere to medical advice when they have um, physicians that look like them or healthcare providers that look like them. So workforce diversity is definitely an issue as well as at the prenatal space, increasing our workforce to include um, midwives and doulas and other maternal health advocates, um, I think are, are, you know, are, are other ways to, uh, uh, decrease the barriers that exist. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, Jacqueline, could you please tell us about your efforts or recent efforts to fight for abortion access, birth control, and healthcare equity? Um, of course, there have been a number of marches or a number of demonstrations and rallies going on to fight for reproductive health and rights. Um, and what role is Planned Parenthood playing to support these efforts? Um, thanks so so much. I I just want to um, begin uh, oh, answering that question by reminding us. We just heard um, Bridget talk about the the state of Texas, but to put a real face on what is going on, um, we I, I want to just center the the people, right? Um, but even before talking about the organization and what Planned Parenthood has been doing, it's been two months since abortion access after six weeks has not been available. In Texas, a state that normally sees 55,000 people for abortions annually. So we're two months in, patients are extremely scared. They're very confused. Um, many people are unable to get the healthcare they need. We've seen this have a ripple effect across the country where hundreds of people are going, unfortunately having to go out of state um, to neighboring states as Illinois, California, New York. Um, we've heard awful stories um, from patients of people who have even Ubered uh, out of Texas incurring additional cost. And many, um, unfortunately, 
who cannot get out of Texas um, or are continuing to be uh, forced uh, to carry those pregnancies to term. And so we, we know that this law is doing exactly what it meant to do, which is to spread fear and confusion. Um, and we are seeing that many other hostile states are starting to take notes. Places like Arkansas and Florida and Ohio have announced they are considering copycat legislation. Um, and so it is um, really important to center the patients. And one of the things that we have been doing um, is really trying to lift up the, the work, the, the, the stories of patients. Um, part of um, the one of the amicus briefs that uh, Planned Parenthood filed in the US v. Texas, the Department of Justice's case against Texas, was an amicus brief um, that is full of stories, just the stories of lived true experiences of the people um, and the difficult choices they're having to make. Um, and it's really important um, just to note there's a new uh, poll out today from the Washington Post showing that um, by a rate of two to one, um, the Supreme Court Americans do not support this ban. They, they actually, Americans, uh, two to one, support upholding Roe v. Wade. Um, and I think the, the, this morning's poll um, and what we know to be true still stands, which is it is not popular in any state to ban abortion. Um, it's not a popular position. And, um, you know, we uh, at Planned Parenthood, we have seen a thousand and eighty two percent increase um, in uh, the uh, Texas patients who are having to go um, to other states. So we are really focused on um, uh, one hand, the, the patient care side, uh, what can be done in the surrounding states like New Mexico and Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma is another state that has too many restrictions on the book. So even getting out of Texas and getting to Oklahoma is uh, it's creating difficult uh, choices for people. So um, we are we are really trying to to on the care side focus on you know thinking about creative ways for the um, providers right to get to those other states that people are, are most often likely to travel to. Um, and then on the advocacy side, we are continuing to raise awareness about um, this issue. It is breaking through. People are paying attention. Um, we are in addition to organizing um, the abortion justice rally on October the 2nd, um, Planned Parenthood along with CRR, many of the coalition partners here will be um, with the uh, with uh, st abortion storytellers uh, in front of the Supreme Court on December 1st. Um, and then we're really gearing up for 2022, knowing that as we see many of these states who are um, going to look to pass similar laws, um, we're also thinking about where uh, states can be more proactive and put forward um, on the books good laws. Um, and we know that many states are already uh, considering what they can do in the next legislative session um, uh, in those states that want to be supportive of Roe. And we've seen um, many states who are uh, working to get some of the bad uh, abortion bans. Many of them, several states had bans on their books even before Roe v. Wade, so our pre-Roe uh, 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 bans. And we know that there are some states that are working to get those uh, off the books to re uh, enforce that their state does support uh, people's access. Um, so we, uh, as uh, the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, our uh, advocacy side, obviously, are also thinking ahead to 2022 and the elections and how to make this a voting issue for people. It will be top of mind um, for folks. And so we are making sure that voters have um, access to information. And then I always tell people that if you're uh, interested and want to know how to get involved, um, you can always uh, follow us at at PPACT, either on Twitter or Instagram, um, there's always actions that we are asking um, supporters to take, whether it be online, contacting state legislators. And then um, I just wanted to wrap by saying one positive thing that I don't think we got to talk about, um, about uh, broader access issues. We do have uh, a, a lot of support in the Biden-Harris administration. And so uh, we have been working uh, with them to correct many uh, things that would increase access to family planning, such as um, they've put forward a regulation around uh, allowing uh, no discrimination in the Title X family planning provider program, um, allowing um, once again, uh, before uh, the previous administration had, had um, put forward a gag rule uh, on that program, but now the Biden-Harris administration is doing the right thing there. They're helping to expand, um, working to push the expansion of Medicaid, um, which is uh, 
central to people getting access uh, to family planning. Um, and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they put out the very first, um, uh, the Gender Policy Council in the White House put out the very first uh, gender um, strategy and it re-emphasizing that this administration is doing everything they can and looking uh, how to build up uh, equity and gender equity uh, through all of their policy making. So um, it, it's a lot of bad news when we talk about what's going on in the states, but I did want to just uh, note that um, we do have a supportive administration um, that, that is looking at these issues and thinking about it all the time. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Brought up a lot of important points there. And I'd like to just um, hop on the first one. Um, how is this affecting Planned Parenthood and you know, most of the Southern states and in Mississippi? And how do you feel what's happening there? In regards to policy and legislation, yeah, um, you know, I think that um, what we are really planning for a. I think you heard Bridget mentioned 2021 was an unprecedented year. We had never seen the number of restrictions introduced in states um, as we had. And I think 2022 is going to be as bad or even worse. Um, so we are doing um, a lot of planning with the Planned Parenthood affiliates in states to think about that state legislative sessions um, and how, uh, whether they're in, a, in a, a, a state legislature who wants to work to protect access, that they have proactive policy measures, um, whether it be a working on maternal health Health. Um, other examples include making sure that advanced clinic, uh, practitioner clinicians can also um, provide medication abortion so that in, in, uh, increases the number of providers who can give access to abortion. Um, we have uh, some uh, proactive states who are looking at and things like how you uh, better support uh, Medicaid reimbursement for abortion. So there's many things to do. And I think on the, on the unfortunately, on the defensive side, we're also gearing up for states um, to attempt to do the same sort of scheme that, that Texas has done. Uh, and then we have states like Missouri that are just awaiting what the Supreme Court is gonna do. So they have introduced an 18 week ban, a 15 week ban, a 12 week ban, an eight week ban. Um, they are just putting forward these kinds of restrictions in order to take the direction from the Supreme Court. So I anticipate um, this year, next year, sorry, 2022 will be um, a significant time uh, for uh, all, all these state actions to actually start to be implemented um, in, a, in, a, in advance of a June or July hearing uh, result that we're going to get in the Dobbs uh, v. Jackson Women's Health case. So I think that you'll see a big flurry of activity on this issue in the beginning of 2022, and then again middle of 2022 when we actually get the decision. At in each of those um, points, we uh, will be asking uh, our 17 million supporters and activists um, to get engaged in contacting their lawmakers. So there will be no shortage of actions uh, in next year for people to work with. Yes, yes, and absolutely. And of course, we're all um, we're all attorneys here, um, all lawyers here on this panel, except for Dr. Villanueva. Um, we welcome her into into our into our group here. Um, from your and you've mentioned, you know, centering the patients, Jacqueline. That is so very important. Um, it's important that we do that. And you mentioned some of the hardships that um, the patients experience not having this abortion access. Um, from everyone's perspective, as whether it's a medical professional, attorneys and advocates, how can we surmount the vast inequities that really Black women um, experience in regard to um, lack of access to abortion and healthcare coverage? And I'll, you know, I'll start this one with uh, Terry for your thoughts. Sure. Well, I actually, I think you kind of heard how to do it from, from Rachel, from Bridget, from, from Jacqueline already. I mean, first it's to understand that this is a multi-layered issue, right? And the opportunity to understand it as that and to see it under, you know, a variety of lenses and then be prepared to attack it from all angles. I mean, as I'm listening to these experts, to my colleagues on this panel, I'm, I'm envisioning a whole new playbook, um, if you will, for us in the W and how we look at public health initiatives um, and, and particularly how we look at abortion care and reproductive health rights. I mean, there are so many ways that we can shore up the gaps and, sure, and, and ensure that there is access for women, for, for people of color, for members of the LGBTQ community and, and their allies 
um, to look at the legislation that's on the books that we need to get moving. WIPA, we've heard our, our guests already talk about the Momnibus Bill, which I will tell you, um, when you work with WNBA players, when they're your members um, and, and they're the folks that you serve, that means that you you know, get the information because they are preparing to do their homework. They will inform themselves first on any issue. They are not going to shoot from the hip. That's not who they are when they use their platforms, um, when they you know, present themselves as, as advocates on any issue, but particularly this one. And so at the beginning of the season, when we were framing up this agenda and looking at public health and all the opportunities there, um, the Momnibus Bill was one that all the players were kind of texting me about saying, hey, we need more information about this. What does this mean? You know, how is this moving through Congress? Who are the supporters? Like all of that. They, they ask real questions and they want their answers, you know, in real time. And so um, the ability for us to do that and pull together a conversation with Senator Booker um, was particularly important. Um, so again, I think it's it's understanding that there's so many ways to attack this at the state level, at the national level, understand the legislation, where your member is on this. I mean, uh, this is the playbook, honestly, that I am, I'm envisioning us working on and, and working through through this off season and as we prepare for the next the next season. And then um, I'm not even sure who who said it. I, I, I think it might have been Jacqueline, but or, or maybe Bridget. But let's remember, you know, we've got to rally behind our vice president. I mean, Kamala Harris, you know, she, we got to help her push forward um, her agenda because her agenda is our agenda. Let's be really clear. Um, she's working for us and she needs us. So um, we've got to be mindful of what she's doing. We've got to tout her accomplishments and we've got to, we've got to do it in a very loud, bold, proud way. So that's just kind of the way I'm, I'm looking at that. Um, I'll just turn it over to my guests for their thoughts too. Thanks, Terry. I, I just wanted to um, double click on that point about the vice president. I think it's important. Most people may not realize um, when SB8 happened, um, just really to talk about the, the leadership we have. Uh, she was the first vice president, we believe, I, I would love for somebody to tell me there's been another example, <laughs> the first vice president to host abortion providers in the White House. She brought doctors and patients and clinic workers um, from Texas to actually hear about what was going on on the ground and um, really using the bully pulpit of the vice president's office to make sure from the highest offices in the land, we were drawing attention to this issue. And it was really, you know, Harris and, and her team's leadership um, to make, uh, make sure that the stories of, of people um, getting out. And, and that, that happened in the first probably three weeks after the law went into effect. And I just want to say that I think really feeling empowered both individually and as a community, um, which Terry, I think you really harped on is, you know, the community building that we're seeing. And Jacqueline also mentioned that as well. Um, but just from a very real world perspective, really being empowered to advocate for one's own health is very important and to be heard and listened to. Um, when we talk about these issues. These are very much real world issues that are impacting uh, real people on the ground and centering those stories like you see, um, like Jacqueline mentioned in the amicus brief that was filed. Um, there was one filed actually in both the uh, DOJ case as well as the Mississippi case as well. And these stories are extremely powerful and necessary um, to not only make, under, to ensure that people feel heard and seen, um, but that people really can, other people that may not have had those experiences can understand why um, access to comprehensive healthcare is important. And the WNBA and the NMA have such an important role to play in amplifying these messages, as well as um, Planned Parenthood and other and Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, physicians are the trusted messengers here, and the WNBA has an incredible platform. Um, Terry, could you tell us about, um, we continue to hear the phrase reproductive rights and human rights. Can you tell us what this phrase means to the WNBPA and its members? Yes, awesome. Um, reproductive rights or human rights is, is language. It's a phrase that you see that we incorporate in a lot of our messaging. It's it's a hashtag on our, on our social media posts. Um, quite honestly, it's, it's the way that the way my members look at it. Um, it's the fundamental right to make decisions um, about our bodies, about our lives, 
about our careers, about our futures. Um, and, and it's essential that, that the players look at it this way um, because it's, it's really what they fight for, right? They're, when they're fighting for gender equity and equality, when they're fighting for racial equity and, and equality, when they're fighting for economic justice, and this reproductive rights goes right along with that. Um, and, and it's, you know, the right of every pregnant person um, to be able to um, decide whether to continue their pregnancy. And, and as Bridget reminds us, continue their pregnancy prior to viability. Like let's arm ourselves with the language because the, the players have, have understood the issue. Um, and, and so that's the way we, we message it out. Um, it's the right to, to access safe and legal abortion care. Um, these abortion restrictions that emerged out of Texas, emerging out of Mississippi, and um, as Jacqueline is describing, it, it's gonna emerge out of like almost every state in the country, right, by, by 2022. These abortion restrictions are part of, of a, a system that is designed to hold us back, to deny us access and to deny us constitutional rights. And, and the people that are hurt most by this are people that look like the members of the W. They look like us. That's why this issue resonates so much with the members. We're talking about women. We're talking about people of color, LGBTQ members and, and their allies. We're talking about working people, right? Just trying to, to you know, um, provide for their families or, or, or provide, period. And um, we're talking about those who are from, who are living in or who are from rural, com rural communities um, or they're young people. All of that, that's who, that's who makes up the W. So that's why this is so critically important to them. That's why reproductive rights are about what it means to be human in this country and to have human rights. It is at the core of what human rights are. And so when, when my members fight for, for all of this, this is, is clearly something that's gonna be a part of, of their agenda and why it's so very, very important and why it resonates with them. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, your partnership, I mean, I love your energy. We, you are, we are doing great thing, the WMP, BPA is doing great things. Can you talk a little bit about the partnership with Planned Parenthood and Black Women's Health Imperative that you guys have started? Absolutely. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna be in the public health space, you better arm yourselves with organizations or, or surround yourselves with organizations that are in this space and that are doing the work. And so, um, we actually started working with the Black Women's um, Health Imperative last season. And um, it just made sense for us to go back and, and reach out to you, uh, to you all um, to provide us with um, necessary resources to keep, the, to keep our members informed and engaged. Um, and so it is just so meaningful to be able to do this work. And particularly this season, we started our public health initiative around COVID vaccines and vaccine awareness and education. That is why the women of the W can proudly proclaim that they are the first um, professional sports league to and and union to have a 99% vaccination rate. I'm just going to throw that out there um, because we are really proud of that. We're closing in on 100% too. Let me just give you all a little tidbit, a little update. Um, but it's it's because of our work with the Black Women's Health Imperative because that gives us access to experts and access to resources, incredible information. So again, my members are not shooting from the hip when they go out there and when they step out there um, and, and speak to an issue. Um, our work with Planned Parenthood, actually, let me, let me go ahead and give the league credit for this because the WNBA as a league partnered with Planned Parenthood decade, uh, probably a decade ago. It has been that long, right? Jacqueline is shaking her head. Um, and so, you know, our opportunity to, to come together um, with Planned Parenthood and, and Sister Song and Noise for Now and so many organizations and do something boldly in a space that we had never been in. Um, and so Jacqueline, I thank you and, and, and your team for, for this, but you know, not too long ago, there was a very proud, very bold statement on reproductive rights as human rights. 
in the Sunday New York Times, there was one of those full page ads and we all know how much those ads cost. We all know what kind of resources it takes to put something like that together to get an actual full page in a major publication like that and, and to just make a statement. And so um, that's our opportunity to, to work with Planned Parenthood. That was the start. Um, it's, it's certainly not where we will end. Um, again, we are, we are just so happy to be soldiers um, in this overall effort um, and um, you know, just looking forward to our work and understanding quite clearly, um, Jacqueline, Rachel, Bridget, you know, quite clearly that 2022, we've got um, so much work ahead of us, but it's here, we are here, like I said, we are soldiers standing strong for, to support your efforts. Thank you so much, Terry. And we absolutely do need black doctors and they've been so critical in this role, especially during the pandemic. And Rachel, could you talk a little bit about how and the National Medical Association, I know you've partnered with Planned Parenthood and other organizations, um, and your, as, as I said before, your role during COVID has been so very powerful. How can lawyers work with the National Medical Association to amplify these messages? Yeah, I think it's uh, critical. I'm, I'm just going to first put a plug. I'm so glad that um, the WNBA is 99% um, vaccinated. I think that's actually incredible. Um, and I think just to, you know, obviously put a plug in for if, you know, individuals are not yet vaccinated, that they definitely, vaccines are safe, they're effective. Um, women who are considering uh, or persons considering um, becoming pregnant, pregnant persons, postpartum, all critical to getting the vaccine. And um, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there that has literally been killing our community. And so I think it's just so important to reiterate, especially for women of color and communities of color. Again, we are always disproportionately impacted, but severe disease and dying at three times the rate of uh, white individuals we really need to make sure that we get proper information out to our communities and make sure that that um, that people are vaccinated. So that's that's I, I think a really important part of um, reproductive um, health as well is just making sure their overall health is 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 good. Um, but as far as you know, partnerships, I think it's really critical for for both of our organizations to work together. That's why I was so excited to be invited to be part of this panel. I think it complements, we complement each other very well, you know, obviously in our communities and in, in working in healthcare, we see the ramifications of what policies are coming down the pike. The fact that our patients cannot get life-saving treatments such as an abortion. I mean, when it comes down to it, this is not a moral issue, it's, it's a health issue. And for some women, we know that our, that black women are dying disproportionately as Bridget mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar and um, unintended pregnancies mean potential unintended deaths for women of color. And so I think it's working together, raising our voices. I think um, policy is just an important part of, of making sure that we advocate for, um, for uh, access to healthcare, which is on my end, but then the policy on the lawyer's end, I think, you know, we just continue like the collective needs to work together and raise our voices. Yes. Um, what is your vision with the NMA priorities and how um, in regard to some of these health disparities? Uh, I mean, you know, each each president has their kind of own vision for for their uh, year. I think overall, my year as an OBGYN has definitely been um, women focused um, in all aspects, um, professionally and health-wise, mental health as well. Um, so, uh, and I think in this respect, maternal mortality, black maternal mortality obviously has to be one of our primary focuses. Um, and, you know, those rates three to four times in, I live in New York City, it's eight to 12 times in New York City. I mean, it's unacceptable. These disparities have been, ex has the gap has only widened over the past hundred years. These are not new disparities. You know, it, it, it's now gaining attention, which is so important, um, especially in, in, in arenas such as this and spaces like this. 
um, but these are not new issues. Our disparities in general are um, disproportionate and not improving. COVID has only compounded these issues for people of color and specifically women of color were impacted uh, disproportionately as well. Um, and, and, and just really trying to achieve the goal of optimal health for women of color and health equity is really an important part of my year as president. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. You know, again, really want to just reiterate that it's so important to have trusted messengers and a Black doctor as part of having that and having our voices heard. Um, so thank you for your expertise. I think now we're going to open up to some questions for, for Q&A um, uh, from the audience. Um, and while we do that, I guess I could start with the one of the first questions is here. Um, of course, you know, the COVID pandemic has really affected all facets of our lives. Can you speak to the importance of receiving the COVID-19 vaccination and its intersection with reproductive health? Dr. Villanueva, Rachel? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Uh, obviously the vaccine, you know, is safe, effective and necessary. We are so fortunate now that children five years to 11 have been approved for the vaccination. So really anyone five years and above should get vaccinated. Um, it's affecting our community. It's affecting our reproductive health as well. We see with the Delta variant, it's disproportionately impacting um, pregnant persons who are dying at disproportionate rates as, as well as for, for pregnancy outcomes, um, preterm labor, stillbirth, ICU admissions. So it's just, it's so crucial really for every single person that it's available to over the age of five to get vaccinated, but particularly our women or pregnant persons or people thinking of becoming pregnant, it's it, critically important and, and critically important that we understand that it is safe and effective, does not cause infertility, does not cause uh, increased risk of spontaneous abortions. All of the misinformation that's on social media is, again, like I said, literally killing our community. Um, and we just need to continue to say over and over again, these are safe and effective um, and are really the only way that uh, our society will be able to move forward from the pandemic. I just wanted to quickly um, share that same sentiment. Obviously, as a, as a healthcare provider and a trusted messenger, it's been really important for um, Planned Parenthood to support um, the vaccine outreach. In, in May of this year, we launched a $2 million bilingual campaign called Protect Everybody. Um, it is meant to educate and encourage people to get the vaccine using um, various platforms, um, social media, email, um, website, and really a grassroots effort um, that's really focused on young people um, uh, and um, um, and it is designed to help combat disinformation. Exactly what uh, we heard Rachel just talking about is that medically inaccurate information um, disproportionately is harming you know, access in our communities. Um, and over the summer, we also engaged in one-on-one -on -one, um, outreach doing canvassing um, and door knocking, phone banking in Michigan, Nevada, and North Carolina. Um, and uh, that allow us to have contact with about 50,000 individuals, again, just in an effort to get more information out about the vaccine. And, and if I can kind of jump in too, if, if we can just use what Rachel said and, and just create a sound bite that we can put out there on social media, okay. because we need that good information circulating out there. It is so important, like make, make the post and we, we will post it several times. We will share <laughs> it um, with our community. I, I just think it's so, so important. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons why we got to a 99% vaccination rate was because we had trusted voices like Rachel um, um, in educational Zooms for the players. I mean, folks that look like them um, and speak to them and, and, and could answer their questions um, is just how we got there. Just again, just putting out the credible information and the way Rachel just said it, it was so succinct. So I'm, I'm actually really serious about that. If we could just like capture that, <laughs> she'll let us um, and post it everywhere. I think it will be so beneficial to our community. Yes, and, and, and lawyers and doctors alike are really at the forefront of the many key issues that impact the Black community. How can, um, to Terry, Jacqueline, and uh, Bridget, how can uh, lawyers and the MBA lawyers uh, do to be helpful? And I think we just talked to uh, mention some of the things um, that uh, 
that uh, Jacqueline said they were just doing or, and their organization was doing to get out the word, but what other things can the NBA do specifically um, to help, help get out the message? Well, first, I just want to say I think the NBA is already doing a fantastic job, um, even just hosting webinars like this to educate other lawyers on issues surrounding reproductive health. Um, so this is a great first step, but also, um, you know, advocating with your local legislatures uh, or federal and state. Uh, most bar associations have lobby days. Um, and so making sure that these issues are centered um, in those discussions as well. Um, also, um, if there's an advocacy committee, for instance, if we know that issues are coming down the pipeline, if we're paying attention to what, what's happening um, in Congress or locally, um, we can put together advocacy campaigns to advocate on these issues as they come forth. I guess I would just jump in and say to the extent that you have a uh, capacity, it would be amazing if we had more black attorneys who were doing this work and pro bono. Um, I think the number of states that we are gonna have uh, uh, trying to push forward even more restrictive laws in an effort to um, get cases to the Supreme Court um, and uh, would definitely think that if you have that capacity or interest, obviously we need we need more folks like Bridget who uh, do the litigating part of this work, and that's uh, obviously a need. And so thanks to NBA for getting this um, opportunity out, and you know give something for for Black lawyers to consider jumping in the fight in that way. And there's so much great information coming across. Terry, you mentioned the soundbite, capturing the soundbite. Can you please repeat what that soundbite was for the, for the audience so that we have it and we could, you know, um, elevate it uh, to the nth degree? What was that soundbite that you just mentioned, Terry? Well, it's I'm I would be paraphrase, paraphrasing Rachel, but what she said was, you know, the COVID vaccine is safe, and for anybody who's age five or older, they should get vaccinated like today. Um, it is safe for for pregnant people. It is safe for women. It is safe for for folks who are thinking about becoming pregnant. Um, it will not um, cause infertility, a and. Um, and, and we just have to counter the bad information that's out there. Well, the way Rachel said it, I think I rattled off like three or four of the probably eight or nine points, but the way she did it, I just thought was beautiful. And let's face it, it came from a doctor and it, it came from the president. Um, I mean, she's she holds quite a position and it's just folks in our community need to see her. Because I tell you, it makes a difference when we had epidemiologists, when we had OBG GYNs, when we had folks from the mental health profession, folks who touched the virus in some way, trials at every level, and we brought them together on Zooms and put them before our players, our, you know, I just had to sit back and let them talk and let them engage and ask the questions in a safe space and hear from them. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And thank you, Dr. Villanueva, for that. Perfect um, soundbite yeah. that's going to help all of us out here um, well, be safe and be healthy. Like definitely, have been doing a lot of um, every day in my office. You know, I ask whoever comes in. I see pregnant, non-pregnant. Are you vaccinated? Why are you not vaccinated? You know, I've had people tell me I'm here for an exam, not to talk about the vaccine, but I don't really care. <laughs> I mean, I do care, which is why I'm talking. But but you know, I really am. I'm just trying to. There's so much. I mean, and, and they have quite right, you know, they're rightfully asking questions, they're concerned. And I think just being able to answer those questions from someone that they know that they've met multiple times, not just someone on TV is important. Um, I've, you know, NMA has also been part of HHS as we can do this campaign specifically targeting communities of color. So I've been doing a lot of um, radio and print media in black communities specifically. Um, and so that's why the sound, sound bite is so succinct now <laughs> because we've been doing it a lot. But, and then now it's also just to make sure we also get our boosters, whoever's uh, eligible for the booster to make sure they get their booster and uh, pregnant persons and postpartum persons are people who should be getting their booster as well. 
Thank you for that. Yes, we all need to get our booster shots and be vaccinated during this pandemic so we can all stay safe. Um, looks like we're closing in on time here and I just like to leave some room for closing remarks. And I really just want to go around around Robin to all of you all and ask you, what do you want the audience to remember from this dynamic discussion on reproductive health rights in the Supreme Court and how we can collectively protect our bodies and rights? So I could start it out with Bridget. I would say to just stay engaged, um, continue to remain knowledgeable and do what you can to advocate, um, not just for your community, but also for yourself. Okay. And some popcorn style, I'm happy to keep it, keep yeah. it going. Um, yeah, I uh, thank you very much to everybody. It's tremendous to be uh, with this group of amazing uh, uh, black experts and speakers today. So really appreciate NBA hosting us. I, I would say that um, uh, we, are, we are looking at an unprecedented point in time. There is nearly 50 years of precedent that the Supreme Court stands to overrule. Um, these same state legislators are the same who are trying to take away our voting rights, take away our abortion rights. And uh, we all have to ask ourselves, like, where do we want to be when Roe falls? And what are we going to contribute to this moment and this movement? And there are many ways for us all to get involved and, um, and encourage uh, your communities to get involved, too. If I can just jump in, um, because my remarks are kind of dovetailing off of what Jacqueline just said, and, and mostly because I want Rachel to have the last word on, on this. Um, but uh, overruling Roe um, would be, I think we all need to understand, it, it's going to be a major, major step backwards. Um, denial, equal rights to generations of, of girls, to of women. Um, present and future athletes, if I could just take that lens for a second, will have less control um, in defining their own life course um, from education to sport, to their careers, including careers in sport. They're gonna, and, and, and also to how they form their families and when they form their families, they're going to have less control. Think about this. Overruling would be a major step back because they would have less control than their mothers and their grandmothers. That is the impact of this. And I, I, I think if we just think about that and, and all that, that the folks had to say today, um, I think that just really sends this home. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I, I've just been in awe. I've just been really sitting and absorbing all of um, this wonderful collective of powerful Black women. I think it's so empowering to be on a panel like this. The power that we have in our respective areas, you know, I think we need to harness to make sure that women's reproductive health rights and women's rights in general um, are preserved. I am absolutely terrified of the fact um, or, or the prospect of, of what is going to happen in our courts um, for the health and well being of Black women? I'm afraid of patients who need to have abortion care to save their lives. Um, and I just am afraid of what it's going to do to our community overall. Um, and so I just, you know, I hope that we'll continue these conversations moving forward. And I really hope. Each of these groups will continue to engage the National Medical Association. Um, I'm, I'm so um, interested in continuing our work with all of you. So um, I'm just going to put in a plug for that. Um, and I just really wanted to thank the MBA for the ability to have this conversation today. And thank you. And I just want to thank all of my panelists here today. I'm in deep gratitude for your time and expertise. It is in. We need all of you in our ecosystem, Center for Reproductive Rights, Planned Parenthood, Women's National Basketball Players Association, National Medical Association, and Black lawyers. Collectively, fundamental change will take all of us. Thank you so much, National Bar Association and National Bar Association Health Section. Uh, we hope to have many more conversations. And thank you so much for joining us today in this very important discussion. 
Thank you so much.